Glad to be here. Um, my name is Chris Beer. I'm affiliated with the University of Newcastle. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we are gathered on and that this project engages with the land of the Darkinjung people. Um, it stems from a wider project I'm uh, currently in the middle of, looking at the sub suburbanisation of the Central Coast in the postal era broadly from 1945 to the end of the 90s. So it's excerpts from that. Uh, my personal background and interest is in urban politics. And I guess for today, I've chosen to uh, provide a regional history of uh, the Menzies era, noting that uh, I guess that Menzies, the Menzies period of government was experienced in different ways in different parts of Australia. And um, I believe that the Central Coast has uh, particularly interesting stories to tell from that context. Um, okay. okay, so the region. So for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, where I'm talking about, the Central Coast lies between uh, Sydney to the south there and Newcastle, hence the name Central Coast, it's essentially the centre of the coast of New South Wales. Um, its main, uh, main town is Gosford, which I presume most people will have heard of. Uh, other places you might have heard of include Woi Woi, uh, home to Spike, Spike Milligan's mother, famous comedian of the mid-century period. Um, and Tarragal is the other uh, perhaps notable settlement, perhaps more famous for ALP politics. There was a notorious 1975 conference there, and uh, a faction in state politics were known as the Tarragals in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, so that's a little bit of Australian political history from the region that I won't be touching on today. Um, in terms of its look and feel, basically think of the northern beaches of Sydney, so the area from Manly to Palm Beach, it's roughly that sort of coastline, that sort of environment. Um, and um, for, the, for the purposes of this talk, uh, think of it as essentially a rural area in 1945, characterised basically by forestry, market gardening, uh, holiday, some small holiday guest houses. Although it is notable for having a coal mining industry in the northern part of the area. So uh, the Lake Macquarie area, sort of adjacent to Hunter and Newcastle, did actually have coal mining. Uh, and that's part of its political story as well, as you might imagine. Okay, so speaking to the broader context, um, the Mendes era uh, has its own, I guess, historiography in terms of Australian urban history. Um, at least one person earlier today has already mentioned uh, there was a period of making a property owning democracy. Uh, Australia has always, always had high, historically high levels of home ownership, uh, and this period went to its absolute maximum. So it started with roughly 50% of people were homeowners uh, around the end of, at the end of the Second World War. Uh, by the mid '60s, that reached uh, in excess of 70 percent, and for actually, and for some cohorts, uh, younger people actually touched 90 percent. So this is this is this is the absolute ascendancy of that of the era of property, property owning uh, democracy. Um, this was a deliberate effort of government policy. Um, the Commonwealth Commonwealth State Housing Agreements uh, were used to leverage home ownership. Uh, roughly a third of all uh, owner occupier finance. Uh, towards the, the end of this period uh, was being provided by the Commonwealth in some form, whether through uh, uh, provisions to um, lending, lending institutions, through loans to veterans, or um, other, other mechanisms, or sort of interest rate controls, and um, rent controls limited the attractiveness of landlordism. So there's very little co competition from investors in terms of uh, uh, the market for home ownership. Um, so, Everyone here could probably imagine what uh, has, has a mental image of suburbia in the 50s in Australia. Uh, so waves of suburbs creeping up from around our major cities. Um, there's, a, there's a historiography of a, a frontier a frontier time. There's a famous American book about American suburbanization called The Crab Grass, Crab Grass Frontier. Uh, Australians, Australian academics, so it was written in the mid-80s. Australian academics in the mid-90s wrote their version of this called um, the Green Brick Frontier, I believe. Um, so it's that sort of uh, that sort of physical manifestation of, of the Menzies era is perhaps a, a really strong mental image. Um, it was the age, it was the commencement of mass automobility. Auto um, so the image on the right, right of the slides uh, show uh, an arch uh, built by the um, motor industry uh, motor industry lobby group uh, to commemorate the visit of Queen Elizabeth II in 1953. That's Macquarie um, Street in Sydney, running down to the harbour. So that was um, very much part of the uh, the, men, the era of Menzies urbanism. Of course, the governments one of their, one of their key platforms in uh, 1949 was 
getting rid of petrol, ra petrol rationing. So that was why clearly a boost towards that, um, that direction in our cities. Um, other, other key issues or other key things that happened um, was the commencement or the continuation of mass migration uh, to our cities, as that was again mentioned. Something like 2 million people migrated net to Australia from a starting population of 8 million uh, in the decades up to, up to the 70s. Um, and then alongside that, the growth was also driven by the baby boom, of course, but less, perhaps less well known is the marriage boom behind, this, behind the baby boom. So um, uh, during this period, 95% of women were married at some point in their life, um, which was contrasting with the historic average of 85% for the uh, First World War. Uh, and of course, then there's the, I guess, the overarching narrative of um, this being an age of affluence. Um, the term milk bar economy has been used uh, by uh, Copeland, Copeland uh, to describe this. It's one of those terms, I guess, like the lucky country that was perhaps used originally ironically or uh, derogatively, but in fact actually sounds quite good when you think about it. Um, so, this, this, this is um, to this, uh, my PhD, one of my PhD supervisors, Nick Brown, who wrote a great history of the 50s called Governing Prosperity. Uh, and he talks about this being an age where freedoms and satisfactions were finally uh, achieved like after, the, after the austerity of the 30s and 40s. Um, so just to round up those things in the slide, oh, sorry, that last point in that slide is um, decentralization was a, another key theme of this era. So even though our cities were growing enormously, um, there was still a lot of uh, public debate around pushing people out to the regions, not pushing but encouraging the development of the regions. Um, this, was, this was a bipartisan thing. Um, people, some people saw this as a, a urban efficiencies thing. It's more efficient to have people spread across the country rather than clustered and congested in major cities. Others saw it as a moral, a moral project in place people could have uh, fuller community lives and be, I guess, uh, better citizens in the uh, in the lower key environments offered by regional areas. Cool. So from that background, um, so I'll move on to the Central Coast specifically. Uh, the image on the right there, for those of you who know the region, is uh, north of Boca in around the early 50s. Today, that's a, it's, it's the median house price is about 1.7 million. It's a lot more if you're on the beachfront. Um, but as you can see, it was reasonably low key back then. Um, so I like to think of the Central Coast as something of a crucible of Australian sea change. So sea change is really the big one of the big demographic stories of Australia in the second half of the 20th century, and the Central Coast, perhaps along with the Gold Coast, is one of the regions where it really started and got underway. Um, so during the period of the interest in this conference, uh, the Central Coast population jumped up from 20, about 30,000 to about 40,000, and that was associated by a building boom, sorry, that was complemented by a building boom, which saw more than a doubling of dwellings in the region. Um, it's uh, the demographics behind this are kind of interesting. It had very particular, uh, uh, I guess, people stories. People stories behind this. Uh, a lot of older people. The demographics uh, were definitely of older people who moved there for retirement. Uh, they were overwhelmingly Australian-born as opposed to new new Australians. And then there's also uh, an element of um, long-distance commute, long commuters to Sydney. So for those of you who um, again know the region, there's a nice motorway between Sydney and Gosford, Sydney and the Central Coast these days, which is very spectacular kind of carving through the sandstone country. Uh, the road like that back in the Menzies era was nothing like that, so you would have to be very committed to have driven us, or there were uh, steam trains that also offered direct connectivity. So nonetheless, uh, people were willing to make that distance then and as they are now. So even today, like something like a third of the workforce of this region still commutes into Sydney proper to um, work and Live, with, live, live by the beach. So um, I've noticed there that the I've got a uh, second to the bottom dot, uh, dot points is about the land market. So it's quite interesting. Um, so the the home ownership rate exceeded um, that of the, the of Australia as a whole and, and Sydney as a whole, uh, and a substantial proportion of that of was actually weekenders or second homes. So this is really as the affluent society made. Made in Britain, or not, maybe not Britain, certainly Fibro, um, uh, by the beach. So it's a, it's a real transformation of the Australian uh, built environment through through the era. Um, and the land was cheap. So I've mentioned there was a land glut. So <laughs> you, when you read the, the local histories, you hear of um, uh, waiters and clerks and other people with 
very modest means, being able to purchase multiple blocks of land. Um, I think I've calculated that land by the land by the beach has always been expensive, but anything further back was something you could buy a block for something like five percent of the annual male wage at that time. So it's a completely uh, a unique market, not unique market. It's a very distinct market compared to uh, where we've moved on from then. Okay. So how did this all play out politically? Uh, on the right-hand side of my slide there is the division of Robertson as it stood in 1948. Um, so it's kind of hard to see. I apologize for that, but the thick red line, if I go off-piste and wander and point, is that going to create problems, or is that? Can I, just, can I, take, can I take the microphone with me? Uh, no, it's just too hard. It's, 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 I don't feel worried about it. Uh, so essentially, uh, it is hard to see, hard to see. Anyway, so basically we're looking at uh, the area between Sydney and Newcastle. Uh, the division of Robertson uh, today is, is much smaller than this area. So today it takes in um, parts of what's now Barara. There's the electric Dobell, the electric Shortland, uh, uh, which now uh, eat into, in, eat into its current area quite substantially. Um, but uh, and it's, it's, the electric itself is something of, of a, yeah, a geographical representation of sea change. So like... Um, like the population as a whole, the uh, at, uh, at federations, the Robinsons of Federation electorates, and um, originally it was centered around the Mudgee and um, Dubbo area, but by the by the fifties it moved moved to the sea as, as <laughs> with the people. So it's kind of a, a curious political ge geographic representation of um, the sea changing phenomenon. Anyway, um, so yes, in terms of the political political history of the of the region during this period, um, the Liberals gained it in forty nine, um, and they held onto it in fifty one. They did say that the population did say no to the um, uh, the Communist Party referendum in 1951 by a reasonably margin, uh, and then they, nonetheless, the Liberals held it uh, in 54, just over 50 percent on the basis of communist preferences. So it's um, it's quite a curious it's quite a curious little story. Okay, so my slide here, uh, the man on the right is Roger Dean, who was the uh, uh, the Liberal MP throughout that period. So as I mentioned, he picked it up in '49. Um, his family background is uh, just perhaps typical of, I guess, the, the non-Labour side of pol politics. Um, his family owned a brickworks in Newcastle, uh, served overseas during the Second World War, uh, sorry, also in the Northern Territory as, as a lieutenant in the, uh, I believe, the army. Uh, came back, um, got into politics. Um, was met his wife. His wife was a, a secretary. Uh, in the New South Wales Liberal, uh, Liberal Party uh, office, uh, and won the 1949 election. He got pre-selection essentially as a compromise candidate. Um, there was, even though he was from just outside the area, he was seen as wasn't tied to either two or two other competing candidates, and uh, was was able to enter part get pre-selection that way. Um, he mentioned um, that his, his ALP can, his ALP opponent at the time. Uh, sort of was, he had the appearance of cruising and didn't um, really work, to, work that hard, and that helped him obviously get over the line. Um, he also has acknowledged that he needed basically, a, I mentioned the coal mining earlier, he needed basically to win a third of those coal miners' votes to uh, get the numbers he needed, which obviously he achieved. So he, he talks about going down into the mines uh, in, his, in, a, in an oral history project he did for the um, uh, Australian Parliament House in 1984 which is a treasure trove of information about him in the Central Coast. Um, so, yes, he, 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 he actually, he also in that, in that interview, you mentioned that he didn't actually blame the miners for going, going on strike at that time, not so much in terms of wages, but just in terms of the conditions that they uh, had to endure. So he had some sympathy for coal miners, um, even as, as a, uh, in his later years. Um, so as a, as a local MP, he um, uh, talks about... Um, he basically was a he was he was a very orthodox, um, too loyal of followers is one assessment of him. Um, so he never made it never made it to the ministry. Um, he was I guess seen not seen as not assertive enough to um, uh, earn his earn his place at that table. But he uh, did eventually get the role of administrator of the Northern Territory in 1964, uh, and then that was followed by being the consul general in San Francisco from 1970 to I think 1974 or something like that. So. Um, he certainly achieved some sort of recognition after leaving Parliament. Um, he, yeah, so in, in terms of his public statements, so I've been through the Sydney Morning Herald, the Age, there's a local newspaper called the Gosford Times, and Warren District Advocates. 
Um, so he's made, made various speeches, which are all pretty much were in, ortho, in orthodoxy with um, party, party policy at the time. He encouraged people to be welcoming of new Australians, supported the local flora and fauna protection society, um, and um, so forth. And it was a strong, strong spoke, spoke, spoke strongly in favour of empire and Commonwealth, so no real surprises there. Um, in terms of anti-communism, um, that does come through as a theme in his 1984 uh, uh, oral history uh, transcripts. Um, so he certainly uh, supported the government's position on that and spoke spoke publicly and did, did his bit in the electorate to um, make the government's case, even though the electorate didn't uh, didn't go that way ultimately. Um, uh, but that's that's not to die. This was a real issue for local people. Uh, in, in terms of in terms of other sources, um, uh, the local newspapers note that the, the council uh, rejected the Eureka League, i.e., the youth wing of the Communist Party, um, from having summer camps on the Central Coast. Uh, and also, I came across an example in um, a, a history of one of the uh, beachside suburbs where a women's association in the 1950s uh, had their rules, and one of those were no communists allowed. So people were, this was clearly an issue at a local scale as well as on a national scale. Um, so in terms of his broader views, uh, he, he's, we've talked about Mindy's achievements a lot today. Um, his, he was asked about this in 1984, and he said that um, supporting empire and the development of Australia were Mendes' greatest achievements. And he sort of, but he also said that Mendes, if he, he was asked to name what the biggest failure of Mendes, of Mendes was, and, he said succession planning, and sort of, sort of, they sort of slipped, walked their way into Holt, which was obviously didn't, well, anyway, that, that was his view. Um, and he, in terms of, I guess, the broader politics of the time, he said he, he saw Australians as, quote, a free enterprise people, even if not, even if, even if they weren't uh, coalition supporters. So he saw free enterprise and liberal politics as transcending party, party political lines. Um, oh, sorry, that last dot point there. So Mendes and the Central Coast. So yes, I've come across little snippets of Mendes himself and his interactions with the Central Coast. So being a marginal electorate, he certainly visited on numerous occasions. Um, Dean mentions that he uh, dropped by uh, the Dean house. Mendes dropped by the Dean household on occasion and bought his children toys. So it's appreciated. <laughs> Less appreciated though is uh, Central Coast being quite attractive and. Um, uh, near, near Sydney, uh, Menzies apparently asked Dean to host international visitors more than he'd like, so he found that to be a bit of a drag in the end, but um, I guess you take the good with the bad. So, moving on, so, um, slide, the picture on the right there is Terrigal, Terrigal Beach in the 1950s. It seemed very well protected from the sun in a way that didn't actually expect, I wouldn't have expected in retrospect. I would have thought this, this sun consciousness would come later, but there you go, the archive the archive throws up surprises. Um, so, and we also heard about the, I think it's, we heard earlier on about the Forgotten People's Speech and the Homes Material, Human and Spiritual, uh, and so I've added the, the modifier Coastal, which I believe Coastal Homes for actually uh, combine those all in, a, in all those dimensions of homes in a unique kind of way. So my first stop point there is something of, something of a thought experiment. So I, I, my reading of the Central Coast experience is that uh, it's a very liberal urbanist product. Um, so if you consider, I mean, my knowledge of socialist urbanism is not comprehensive, but I have some awareness of what so urbanism looked like in the socialist countries of the Eastern Bloc during that time. They certainly had seaside resorts in places like Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Black Sea, and so forth. Um, but even on the Baltic and East Germany, but um, but this sort of spontaneous um, choice and enablement of people to be able to build their homes and land all their holiday homes on on mass is really, I think, a product of people of the liberal system giving people choices and people giving, enabling them to live lives in a way that wasn't necessarily foreseen by um, the way that we managed our cities otherwise or could have been managed otherwise. So that second dot point there. I guess sums that up is the Central Coast's experience during the Menzies era is something of a, a, real, a revealed choice around how people value time, distance, and play as opposed to uh, other considerations and all being told how to live their lives. Um, and finally, I think this can also be read here uh, uh, against some broader themes in like Australian historiography from the period. Um, 
uh, what's his name, Robert Hughes, the art historian, in the, in the Fatal Shore, talks about um, Australians having a distinct view of Eden as property. And certainly, um, uh, the I guess, the development of weekenders and a, a livestock housing, I, people moving there for retirement, um, really speaks to, um, speaks to that. Um, and also, um, Les Murray, in his later years, I think through the 90s, wrote a book, or had a, is a collection of essays and his writings uh, called The Quality of Sprawl. Les Murray also lived uh, on the coast, New South Wales coast, a little bit further north, not in this particular region, but certainly his, some of his writing really engages with the development of the coast at this time. And he quotes, um, has an interesting quote of an American, uh, no, sorry, it's an Australian observer of America and Australia. So it's not, it's not, it's not Les Murray's quote himself, he's quoting someone else, where he talks about uh, American seek utopias where Australians seek Arcadias. And um, I think this is a, this uh, movement to the coast that was enabled by our liberal urbanism at the time speaks to that Arcadia seeking of nature and homes and lifestyle being enabled by politics, the politics and policy of that, of that period. So that is my story of Central Coast. Thank you for your time. so much, Christopher. That was uh, fascinating and um, I think a wonderful way to end today because we are getting that snapshot of life in the 50s in this period and what it was like for real people and how they were swinging with the times and um, the trends that they experienced. So any questions for Christopher? Thank you. Charles and then Lucas. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I, I lived on the Central Coast for a year and a half um, about 25 years ago. So yes. um, I, I know something about it. Um, one thing that always struck me about it was um, how white it is. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's obviously not somewhere that um, non-European immigrants have ever went to much. Um, I wondered if anything, anything in your research can sort of throw any light on, on on that and why that might be the case. Was, was, was white Australia a, an issue that came up in the political discussions you, you read about? This observation has certainly been made. Um, I mean, obviously, there's no formal barriers to migrants choosing to live on the Central Coast. There's no one saying, you can't live there. But uh, its, its migration profile is basically uh, white Australians moving from Sydney to there, or certainly during that period, was uh, what happened. Um, whether that's because of particular valuations of the coastal lifestyle amongst white Australians as a particular draw and these weren't shared by migrants is one possible hypothesis. It's, yeah, I mean, in the absence of formal barriers to explain people being excluded, it's hard to explain beyond the, their, the preferences of those migrants for whatever reason. I mean, there's, there's certainly literature on why migrants choose to live where they do. There's, there are clustering effects noted amongst migrant groups, particularly when they're uh, new, newly clustering in a country, but yeah, there's no definitive answer, yeah, but certainly the observation has been made that, that it's, it certainly has a no, no. It certainly, it certainly has a different demographic to the rest of Greater Sydney. Yeah. Sure, but I guess the people there, as you mentioned, there's substantial outmigration for work to to Sydney. Migrants, for whatever reason, during the period weren't attracted to that. Um, it's it's you'd have to do oral history or something to really get into it. There's no clear evidence about it that I'm aware of one way or another. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, in the course of your research, you might not have uh, come across this, but either with the local member that you looked at or Menzies himself, if either of them ever really responded to or engaged in the discussions around suburbanisation, which I know were prominent in Australia at the time, so I know there's that concept of the Australian ugliness, uh, the name of the writer of that escapes me. Yep. Um, but there's also a bit earlier on in the 50s and, and 1940s, the uh, Santa Maria Catholic rural movement, which obviously uh, was critical of, you know, wanted to decentralise the population as well. Yep. And you mentioned about a constant concern for decentralisation during the Menzies period. So is there any sort of uh, writings or anything like that from Menzies or others 
responding to a lot of those critiques of suburban growth and centralization of the population that you're aware of? Not that I'm, not that I'm aware of. Um, I haven't, I mean, certainly you spoke about home, the importance of home as a concept, but in terms, in terms of actually cities and such, there's nothing I'm aware of from Menzies himself. I mean, certainly there were very active debates going on more broadly in Australia at the time, but what I'm aware of, he wasn't a participant personally in those. So I could be wrong, but it's, it's my, it's my uh, understanding. Hi, I just thought I'd make a comment, being a Melbourneian who moved to Sydney nearly 40 years ago. If you look at the Central Coast, I can't think of any industry there that a migrant group might have gone for work reasons. If you go down to Wollongong or go up to Newcastle, and even if you go down to Nara, where I've got a beach house close to Nara, um, in the little beach place where I have, there's quite a few Italians, um, and I think they probably found work in Nara. It may be the Central Coast. I, I don't know, you know a lot more about it than I do, but would there have been any significant industry that would have encouraged them to go there for work? And otherwise, it would have really been the beach culture of the Anglo type of two or three generations Australians. Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a really good observation. So Wollongong uh, has a very substantial multicultural history, and that's because of the still works being a major employer. I think that's less true of Newcastle, but I could be wrong. But, um, yeah, there's nothing like it. Nothing like that in Central Coast that would have um, been an obvious draw for, for um, migrants to move to a snow mountain skiing or anything like that. Um, a bit of an, an attempt to add a bit more light to, to the question. Um, Newcastle, of course, was a steel, steelworks town, and when BHB left, um, the town. I think in a significant measure was actually rejuvenated and light industry came. There's a big aluminium smelter a long way away and Newcastle is a major coal port um, and it is also an entrepot to the whole of the Hunter Valley and the grape industries, uh, the wine industries, etc. So um, the the Central Coast certainly had its its share of what I'd call loosely industrial growth, um, and I think that it's it's increasingly becoming uh, a commodore, a, a, a um, commuter suburb for for Sydney. You know, people there's an increasing number of people who get on a train and go to Sydney to work and come back at the end of the day. So the start the start of the period was around ten percent of commuting. Now it's about thirty five percent. So I mean, these are long journeys, but people are willing to make them. Lifestyle, so and the housing prices, yes, it's not less. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Yeah. They catch the wind. Yeah, yeah. It is. And it still works for a major employer. I was intrigued, Chris, by one of the apparent or possibly actual discrepancies on one of the slides, which indicated that the um, um, unremarkable um, local member, yes, that one, um, Pat Rod, Roger Dean, <laughs> unspectacular. Um, and who, according to your second last book, mobilised the politics of anti-communism and was elected in 49, re-elected in 51, re-elected in 54, and yet that area voted quite convincingly no in Menzies' Communist Party referendum. So that's why this seems to be, and I must be missing something, apparent an apparent disjuncture. Could you reconcile that for us, okay. please? I, I, the, the disjuncture is um, perhaps being unfair. And um, perhaps uh, I was placing more emphasis on him not making minister. I, made, I guess I was placing emphasising that he didn't actually make a minister in a very long parliamentary career. He was seen as loyal. He was seen as doing his, uh, doing his work for the party, but he never actually made it into the ministry. So that's... Uh, the, that's where the unspectacular assessment comes from. I acknowledge that's an entirely subjective judgment. So, um, yes, he certainly had a, a varied career that made strong contributions to 
Australia, and in the context of the Liberal Party, it was obviously seen as valued, but um, never made it to ministers. So that's I guess the the, uh, the assessment I made there from using the word unspectacular. <laughs> so yes, but but picking up on the next question, what's why are they voting for the Liberal Party? Again, because it's tends to have again the more anti liberal politics thread that you can that, say. That was that was part of a wider movement. So I did it was noted at the time that certain electorates, including Bradfield, so Bradfield is as blue as it gets, and that there was a uh, there was a much lower, there was a significantly lower proportion of people voting, they certainly voted in favour of uh, the uh, Bannon Communist Party, but it was less than their general election vote for the uh, for the MP. So the, even within the Liberal constituency, there was the anti-communist measures weren't universally supported. Okay, thanks greatly, Chris. Look, this is pretty clear from your presentation. This uh, area was, and to some extent I guess still is, an absolute crucible of social and demographic change in Australia. The sort of thing that should be attracting, I would have thought, some of the savvier party strategists of all three major political parties. Was there somewhere there a contest going on to say, this is a new Australia, these are the sorts of people we've got to win over to our side politically? That's very evident in the 80s. In the 80s, environment was all about the environment. So this is when that had suburbanisation, suburbanisation for several decades, and both parties were basically in a, an auction to who could be the most, lo, in a local sense, who can be the most environmentally sensitive. So you have the Liberal Party and the Labour Party both both highlighting their environmental credentials at a local level at that time. Uh, I haven't come across that so clearly in other periods, but certainly that was, that was sort of dynamic in the elections. 